I once heard a woman who lives in a cold and inhospitable climate, kind of like I do, say that she would rather rule the cold than be ruled by the cold. Because the cold can sometimes make decisions for you. For example, I like to run in the mornings, but the days and times when I run in the wintertime are sometimes chosen for me by the cold. Sometimes you'll get invited to go to an event or an occasion and choose not to because of the cold. Sometimes you'll avoid doing chores or going outside for recreational reasons because of the cold. The cold can make your decisions for you sometimes, which is exactly what it means to have something rule over you. In her case, she would rule the cold by choosing to expose herself to it in ways that would strengthen her mind and her body against it and its controlling influence. And one of the ways that she did this was by having morning baths in the freezing cold lake right next to her house. And if we're attentive to it, we might recognize that we embrace something like this principle in our daily lives and in society. We don't want to be ruled by our ignorance, so we choose the sometimes anxiety-inducing and unpleasant experience of schooling and education. We don't want to be ruled by our appetites, so we choose the often unpleasant and mortifying disciplines of nutritious diet and exercise. Some people don't want to be ruled by a fear of water, so they they go through the sometimes unpleasant experience of learning to swim. And think about what that means. To learn to swim means to refine your instincts, your understanding, and your physical reaction to being placed in water. Knowing how to swim means behaving in one exact and precise way and rejecting all other kinds of movements that are incompatible with it. It means restricting and refining your behavior in order to maximize your potential and your freedom to move around in the water so that you rule the water instead of it ruling you. A perverted or a distorted understanding of freedom might say that all these rules and regulations are inhibiting your freedom from swimming however you want. But disregarding those rules and those restrictions actually prevents you from the, from the freedom that knowing how to swim actually provides you when you're in the water. Just like with the rules of the road, if everybody follows those restrictions and those rules of the road, it maximizes our efficiency and effectiveness to get where we're going. But when everybody disregards those rules, it just produces danger, chaos, and immobility. Rules and restrictions are used in countless ways every day to transform that which is crude and unmeasured into something refined and more capable. And again, we recognize this principle at play in countless ways in our everyday life, except for one area, which is sex. We say we don't want any restrictions or any sort of governance on our behavior when it comes to sex, except for the absolute minimum. So as long as you can find another consenting adult, then, then have at her. We don't say with sex that we would rather rule sex rather than our sexual appetite and instincts rule us like we do with everything else. But our ancestors, by contrast, they did recognize that sex was a good and beautiful thing that needed to be refined. It needed to have those governing restrictions placed upon it in order to maximize its potential good. So they said, it should be enjoyed in a certain way that recognizes its purpose, which isn't pleasure, by the way, in the same way that pleasure isn't the purpose of eating, and which places reasonable restrictions upon it so that it doesn't rule us. And this is what marriage and the family has always been. It's been a critical measure that puts reasonable restrictions on sex that anticipates the purpose and consequences of sex, which are that it strengthens an emotional bond between two people and it also produces life. Simultaneously, our ancestors recognized that marriage and the family are essential to raising and nurturing well-adjusted people who could grow in to become well-adjusted citizens who can contribute to society rather than be a burden to it. But over the past hundred years, we've been tinkering with marriage and the family when we shouldn't have been. We've looked at all the progress and prosperity that we've attained and assumed that that was inevitable, just like evolution is naturally inevitable as long as you don't get in its way. And since progress, is inevitable, it happens all on its own, things just naturally get better over time. We don't need to be so careful about the way that we enjoy certain things, and sex is one of those things. So let's, let's remove all these governing restrictions. And in so doing, we have experienced catastrophic consequences for the family, for marriage, 
and for society. We've seen an eruption of sexually transmitted diseases that nobody anticipated, which have costed millions, millions, tens of millions of lives, as well as an incalculable amount of healthcare costs. We've also seen a dramatic explosion of divorce, as well as a host of other consequences, which I'm gonna continue to elaborate on. And in response to that, we've done nothing but double down on our behavior, trying to trying to fix all these little consequences that happen with no appreciation about what's actually causing them. So let's look at some of these causes which we seem to be way too reluctant to talk about. I think, and I'm not alone in this, although this is a minority opinion, which I think definitely needs to be amplified. I think we can trace a lot of this back to the advent and promotion of artificial contraception, which promised us consequence-free sex. But consequences we don't want for refusing to govern ourselves isn't a bad thing, just like with all those other examples we have seen. We choose to govern ourselves so that we won't be ruled by something else or someone else external to us. Again, we, we govern our minds with education in order to refine our knowledge into understanding and learning. We govern our abilities with training in order to refine those abilities into skills. And we govern our bodies with nutrition and exercise to maximize their potential capability. And the negative consequences that come with refusing to do these things are what inspires those good decisions. But when it comes to sex, we thought we had solved everything. We thought we had figured it all out with the magic of contraception. But no contraception is is effective 100% of the time under the best of circumstances. And casual sex is not usually undertaken under the best circumstances. Rates of effectiveness for the methods of contraception that are considered the most effective are anywhere between 90% and 98%, which means that for every 100 instances of casual sex, there are a considerable number of illegal aliens sneaking across the border. And if you multiply that rate by the number of casual sexual encounters that are taking place, you get a lot of unintended pregnancies, which means that we have to have the safety net of abortion because we were promised consequence-free sex, which was and is a lie. And unfortunately, it's a lie that is perpetuated to children through sex education. In my own sex education, I was taught how to use contraception and how to wrap a condom around a banana, but at no point did any of my teachers say that if you do this enough times, you should be prepared for unintended pregnancies and probably abortion. And that's if you use this exactly as it's intended under the best circumstances with no chemical inebriation or anything like that, which is not usually the case. And so tragically, abortion has become necessary for a society that erroneously believes you can have consequence-free casual sex with people that you would never want to raise a child with. And this goes against all prevailing conventional wisdom, and it's the kind of wisdom that, that again is taught to children in grade school, that contraception reduces instances of abortion, which is the exact opposite of the truth. And sadly, as society makes mistakes, there are always those who are eager and willing to exploit those mistakes for their own gain. For example, if we refuse to govern ourselves and our sexual appetites, then there are those like the industrial pornography complex who can exploit that appetite for financial gain. And pharmaceutical companies are likewise invested in our continued agreement with them that sex should be unrestrained so that we continue to be reliant on their magic pills, which don't even work 100% of the time. And pop culture, primarily aimed at minors, also spreads this message of unrestrained sexuality so that sex begins to rule us at critical developmental stages before we can find a way to rule it. And what if all of this does compromise marriage and the family? What's, what's the big deal, right? Well, I would be willing to bet that most of us would agree that ignorance, poverty, and crime are consequences, just to name a few of them, that we might want to reduce in society. Well, if you ever get the opportunity to speak with somebody who has been struck down by ignorance, poverty, and crime and ask them, how did you end up where you are? They will inevitably tell you a story about their family life. They will tell you about neglect, abuse, addiction, and divorce. And the data bears this out so strongly. 
Children who come from dysfunctional and divorced families are far more likely to struggle in their education and therefore their employment opportunities and therefore to deal with outcomes like crime and poverty as a result. So therefore, ideas and policies that reinforce the traditional family that we've come to inherit it are not only good for the family, but for all of society. And that's because if it isn't already obvious, the family is the pillar of civilization. Children who are raised and nurtured by a mother and a father who can exemplify all the aspects of human nature will by far better understand themselves and be able to meet the challenges that they will in their adult lives. Children who are raised with siblings along with those parents that love them will learn to behave in a micro society so that they will better be able to behave in the whole of society. And this for me all comes back to a curious qualification that appears in the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. Because the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments, first of all, they're split up into two sections. The first three commandments are the most critically important and they're about our relationship with God because we can't live in harmony with our neighbor if we don't live in harmony with the source of our own being. Then the next seven are societal norms and as a matter of importance the very first one is to honor your mother and father which is again kind of curious you'd think that not murdering people would be the most critically important but it's not. And then God adds this little note at the end of that commandment. He says that if you, rec if you observe this, then you will prosper in the land that I give you. If you honor the heads of the family as this great and noble venture that they undertake, and if you as a society reinforce that and support them, then society and civilization as a whole will prosper. Hey, thanks for watching that. If you enjoyed it, then be sure to like and subscribe for more. And if you want to support the making of content like this, then please consider joining my online community, The Reinforcements. It's, it's kind of like Patreon, but instead of being beholden to a big tech company, it's a website I built entirely myself. So there's no risk of us being censored or shut down or anything like that. There are hundreds of people who have already signed up and our mission is to renew and reinforce the church. So if that's you, then, then come check it out. As an added bonus for certain tiers, I will also send you a gift box from Glory and Shine, which is a Catholic family owned and operated company. Um, they make bath and body products. They're actually their beard balm. I'm, I'm supporting or I'm, I'm sporting right now. I'm not just a spokesperson, I'm actually a customer. So even if you don't join the reinforcements, maybe check them out anyways. Glory and Shine, they're, they're an amazing company.